Welcome everyone to another virtual discussion hosted by the Canada Strong and Free Network. For those of you who might uh, be joining us for the first time, uh, my name is Jamil Javani and I am president of the Canada Strong and Free Network. Very happy to be hosting this important conversation. Before we get to the specific matters of critical race theory and CRT for today, I do wanna go over some uh, general information about our organization and some of the things we're working on over the next little while. Um, our biggest conference of the year, the biggest conservative networking event of the year is happening in Ottawa in uh, just a month, uh, March 22nd to 24th. I hope that you will join us if you are in Ottawa or if you can make it there. Um, it is going to be incredible. Uh, we expect to have hundreds of people from all across the country joining us. Some of the featured speakers at the conference will be the Honorable Pierre Polyev, leader of the official opposition, also the Right Honorable Stephen J. Harper, uh, former Prime Minister of Canada, uh, the Alberta Premier Danielle Smith will be a speaker, and uh, just some new breaking information we haven't announced yet, but happy to share with you. We'll also have two of the most important media personalities in Canada uh, joining us, one being the editor of the Toronto Sun, Adrian Batra, who will be moderating a conversation on the future of cities with um, uh, Manhattan Institute's Rehan Salam and American reformers, Aaron Wren. And we'll also be welcoming for the first time, independent journalist, Tara Henley, who will be sharing her uh, perspective on the state of Canadian media. Some of you may remember Tara Henley famously uh, quit the CBC um, just about a year ago, making international headlines and certainly has a very unique and valuable perspective on the state of Canadian media. So lots of great speakers, lots of fantastic people will be there. And uh, we're very excited to welcome Canada's conservative movement to Ottawa. So please do see the link in the chat. If you have not got your ticket already, we're still um, uh, doing registration at early bird ticket rates. So uh, you might wanna sign up now before uh, we change the price to the standard price for the ticket, but it will be fantastic. Fantastic, and uh, certainly at least one of the people you'll be hearing from today, Noah Jarvis, will be speaking at the conference as well. So today we're going to be um, uh, focusing on a topic that you probably have seen in the news. Uh, certainly, it's been something that's written about uh, significantly um, by many people uh, throughout Canada and more commonly in the United States, critical race theory. And it's a controversial thing for us to broach. Uh, certainly, we know that lots of people have very strong views on this, including some people who are part of the conservative movement. For example, the former Minister of Industry, uh, James Moore, has been trash talking the Canada Strong and Free Network for daring to hold this event. Um, kind of bizarre to me that uh, people who consider themselves part of the conservative movement are afraid to talk about this, but thankfully there are a lot of emboldened people who understand why this is important. And especially, and this is where James Moore should know better as a former minister, as a former cabinet minister, that this stuff matters to people in the minority communities that these theories are claiming to speak on behalf of, that these theories are shaping the policies that affect us. And for this guy to you know, step on his high horse and think that conservatives should not be wading into controversial territory, especially black conservatives, conservatives from minority communities, it's ridiculous. And I'm very happy and proud to say that we're willing to welcome conversations about things that people like James Moore are afraid to discuss. And unfortunately, the only time these things seem to be acceptable by elites, the only time that elites want to talk about this is when they're platforming liberal perspectives. So when the Empire Club of Canada, for example, brings on people to talk about how critical race theory should be taught in public schools, that's not controversial. The likes of James Moore don't comment on that. But when conservatives want to offer a different point of view, black conservatives in particular, all of a sudden it becomes controversial. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but that's what this organization is about. It's about having the important conversations that too often elites are unwilling to entertain. And that's what we're going to have today. But before I introduce our panelists, and they are a fantastic group of people, I do want to share with you some definitions of critical race theory so that you can uh, know what we're talking about. 
And the reality is that like, depending on what media source you're looking at, depending on what newspaper you might be reading, you might be seeing a completely different definition of what critical race theory means. And people thrive in that confusion because then they can advocate for these ideas without having an actual conversation um, because they can always accuse people of not understanding what you're talking about. Well, you don't have a PhD. You don't go to law school. How will you know what critical race theory is? Well, let's boil this topic down to some very specific definitions. First off, Kimberly Crenshaw, who is regarded as one of the most influential critical race theorists, she's a law professor at Columbia University. In her own words, in comments to the New York Times, she defines critical race theory as follows. A way of seeing, attending to, accounting for, tracing and analyzing the ways that race is produced and the ways that racial inequality is facilitated and the ways that our history has created these inequalities that now can be almost effortlessly reproduced unless we attend to the existence of these inequalities. So that is a definition from one of the most important writers in the critical race theory canon. I want to give you a definition also from a critic of critical race theory, because it actually mirrors what Professor Kimberly Crenshaw says. And it's important to note that critics and proponents of CRT can actually agree on a definition. So the Manhattan Institute's Christopher Rufo, who has written extensively on the topic, again, a conservative offering a different point of view on how we can deal with inequality in society. Um, he has written the following definition. Critical race theory is an academic discipline that holds that the United States is a nation founded on white supremacy and oppression, and that these forces are still at the root of our society. So two definitions that are ultimately saying the same thing, one from a critic of critical race theory, Christopher Rufo, the other from a proponent of CRT, um, in this case, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw from Columbia University. Now, if you hear those words, I'm sure you can recognize that these are really important conversations happening all around us. The language of systemic racism, white privilege is being used by policymakers, government decision makers, uh, corporations, university professors all the time. And the idea that we should not talk about this and that we should not have different points of view on it is ridiculous. And exactly why we are having a conversation today to show you some of the perspectives on critical race theory from black communities that are ignored by the likes of the Empire Club of Canada and frankly dismissed in a very offensive manner by people like a former cabinet minister who calls himself conservative, James Moore. So um, with those definitions in mind, I would like to get our conversation going today. And we're going to start with um, just asking the central question that is the theme of our uh, event today, which is why is critical race theory so controversial? Um, and I'm going to leave this open to our panelists to kind of take that a question in whichever direction they like. Uh, just to introduce our panelists, we're going to start with Mike Ramsey, who is a, an elected school board trustee at the Waterloo Region District School Board. We will also be hearing from the deputy editor of redstate.com, Kira Davis, who's also run for a uh, school board trustee in her community in California. Then we'll be hearing from Samuel Say, who is a writer uh, and a media personality. Um, he, you can find his writing at slowtowrite.com and True North and also a university student and reporter for True North, Noah Jarvis. So that is the lineup we have for you today. And we're gonna start with Mike Ramsey uh, calling in from Waterloo. Mike, why is critical race theory so controversial? Thank you, uh, Jamil, uh, for, for the question. And thank you uh, for giving me the, uh, the opportunity to offer my opinion as a uh, serving trustee with the Waterloo Region District School Board. Um, my apologies, I had some technological challenges there, but it's all sorted out, so I'm pleased to be here. And I think I will start by sharing that um, currently in public schools in uh, Waterloo Region and across our province, uh, students are receiving diversity, equity, and inclusion instruction under the broader title of anti-racism education. And within this, um, students are typically taught about white privilege and implicit or unconscious bias. I will also share, and I can share, that a good number of parents 
legitimately fear that their children are being taught that if they're white, then they're racist. And if they don't agree that they're racist because they're white, then they're doubly racist. And I find as a trustee, I find this troubling. This kind of instruction, I believe, uh, typically teaches students that if they're white, many of the successes they experience are not due to personal effort, but because of the color of their skin. Conversely, students of color are taught that despite personal effort, and I have many examples, their chances of success are significantly diminished because society is systemically racist and therefore inher inherently biased against them. Um, Part and parcel of this, uh, I believe, is that discrimination based on skin color is actually being encouraged through some of the very points that you made um, uh, earlier, not just at our board, but at boards across the province, and I find it troubling. As a result, there is a legitimate concern that the focus of elementary and high school education has moved, and this should concern all parents and um, all citizens across our province, move from promoting skills in literacy and math to promoting a very specific ideological and divisive agenda. These developments, I think, worry many parents. I've heard from them, my colleagues have heard from them, and they've been contacting trustees in, uh, in the hundreds. They've come to us with stories of their children being taught discriminatory concepts that appear to be rooted in critical race theory. They legitimately fear their children are being taught that if they're white, then they're racist. And if they don't agree, they're racist because they're white and they're doubly racist. I, I, you know, I can't emphasize the point enough. One of my colleagues, and I'll wrap up by sharing that one of my colleagues, Trustee Cindy Watson, and I tried to address these uh, concerns with a motion for school board staff to provide a detailed account of what students were being taught. We asked staff to answer specific questions related to how critical race theory was influencing instruction. And I can share that I was unable to present or participate in the discussion of the motion because six white trustees whose supporters referred to me as a white supremacist voted to ban me by removing me from all meetings until that motion was uh, discussed. So basically until the end of September last year for, for just for refusing to support their narrative. And I'll leave it at that and um, you know, look forward to the uh, discussion. Thank you very much, Mike. I uh, really appreciate that. And uh, next up, uh, Kira, uh, welcome. I know this is the first time we've had the pleasure of hosting you. Um, can't wait to hear your answer to why is critical race theory so controversial? Uh, yeah, um, thanks, Mike, for your service and for standing up. That story is so crazy. Um, and I, you know, encountered that a little bit when I was running for school board down here in California, only Black person in the race, only black mom really in the area and still just accused of horrific things because I was running against CRT. It really is insane. And I think this goes to answer the question, Jamil, why is CRT so controversial? And one of the reasons why it's controversial is that it's it's rooted in two things, I believe, um, at the heart of it. I mean, there's an academic explanation for this, right? Would you, you did go through this a little bit at the top. What it is, it really was meant to be taught in, in the aspect of theories in law school. And it's tied to, you know, heady ideas that you talk about in your philosophy class. It was never really meant for the elementary classroom. But the reason why it's sort of matriculating down the line here, I believe, and, and why it's so divisive is, is A, because it is, it houses the gospel of envy. So it's, it, it encompasses this idea that, um, our, that North America, our, our two, particularly our two nations, Canada and the United States, are, are that it's just a pie. It's just a big pie and there's only so many pieces to it. And, um, you know, depending on where you sit at the table, that depends on like how big your piece of the pie is. So it's this idea that everybody's got to get theirs. And at the end of the day, there's only going to be a few crumbs left of this pie. I look at it differently. I look at our nations as a buffet table, right? And the more you bring to that table, the more food there is from everyone for everyone. But this gospel of envy is really housed within this um, this critical race theory uh, um, discussion. 
The other thing I think that's going on here is years and years, decades and decades of white guilt. I don't know if any of you have ever read the book White Guilt by Shelby Steele. If you have not, I really think you should. I highly recommend it. But there is this, I, there is this idea among, I think Mike used this term elite, elite um, white people for, like, for lack of a better way to put it. It's this idea that they're supposed to feel guilty for the sins of the past, guilty for the things that they have, guilty maybe for their own internalized racism, you know, for their own um, racist thoughts and maybe thoughts that aren't very well um, picked through. And so we get, as always, it's ne it's never been different in the, the United States I, from the beginning of recorded history, you know, as always, you get a group, a group of, of liberal white people who who are deciding the levers of equity and um none of them are stepping aside they're just like it's just like well if i just act like i'm concerned about this this will that will be enough to to satiate my guilt that will be enough to reach repentance this and if you're you're noticing i'm using religious terms for this because i do think that there is a religious aspect to this and so you have a group of of white liberals i believe at the top who are trying to alleviate guilt without without giving up their status and as always as black people on the bottom of that of that theory of that of that attempt to sort of right the wrongs of history. Um, and then of course we had the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020, I call it the summer OBLM, you know, when the whole world was watching what was going on in Canada and the United States and how people were protesting and, and they wanted a quick answer. People wanted a quick answer to how we can, we can maybe move into this post-racial society. How can we help people who seem to be genuinely crying out in pain? How can we help people be uplifted and, and, and meld into a prosperous society. And again, CRT came along as sort of this quick fix. Now it also has Marxist roots and BLM has Marxist roots. So it was a, it was a very easy marriage. It was a very quick marriage. And uh, quick, very quickly, the Marxism aspect of it took over the pro-Black aspect of it. Some of you may recall that originally the Black Lives Matter website had as one of their goals to destroy the nuclear family. <laughs> That's not a Black... A, a black value at all. Um, we very much value the nuclear family in the black community and know that, that it's a big part of a healthy community, any healthy community. And yet Black Lives Matter was espousing that. Well, that's because critical race theory had bled into the Black Lives Matter leadership. And so they have to um, create segregation in order to create power structures. This is just another form of segregation, right? It's reforming the power structures, only with some people on, on this side of the fence going, well, the power structure should have more color to it. The power structure should have more women in it. The power structure should have more gay people in it. And so the only way to do that, again, we have this pie. And since there's only so many pieces of the pie to go around, we've got to kick some people off the table. We're not going to make more pies. We're just going to take away the forks of these people who have been eating these big pieces of pie. We're gonna push them aside, but it's just another seg uh, uh, theory of segregation. It's just creating power via segregation is a story as old as time. So of course CRT is going to be controversial because some people who are working hard to be influenced, to be influential in the conversation are pushed aside because of what? Their race, their background, their ethnicity, and that's the same problem that Black people were facing in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, nothing has changed. This is all just an attempt to transfer the balance of power instead of trying to balance power. So in that respect, critical race theory and every other theory like it is going to be controversial. And then one last thing as I close out, the other thing that is very controversial about it, of course, is that there are so many lies being told about what it is. And hopefully we're going to clear up some of that today for the people out there. And, um, you know, one of the most egregious lies is that critical race theory is equal to Black history, that they are one and the same, and they are not at all the same. I do believe that 
that critical race theory is a vague concept and it's vague on purpose so that um, normal people have trouble discussing it and breaking down the ideas and it makes you sort of want to step away from it. I know there's a lot of parents who like throw up their hands. They're like, I don't really understand it. I don't know how to talk about it. And every time I do talk about it, I'm accused of horrible motivation. So I'll just, I just rather would back off. I think that's on purpose too. So, so those are just some uh, ideas about why I think critical race theory has become controversial. Well, thank you very much, Kira. You know, I'd ask our, our audience listening right now, I mean, you've heard, uh, you know, Mike's perspective, you've heard Kira's perspective, two people certainly very close to parents uh, who uh, have dedicated their time to understanding the needs of their community and their school boards. And I would ask you, why do you think that places like the Empire Club of Canada don't want their audiences to hear those perspectives? Why do elitists like James Moore not want people to hear these perspectives? I mean, this is the reality of the conversation around critical race theory, which is that there are so many institutions and people going out of their way to ensure that there is only one side of such an important conversation being presented. And I think it's worth asking why that's the case. Thankfully, uh, we had uh, two of our panelists, Samuel Say and Noah Jarvis, watching the Empire Club's event on critical race theory over the course of the last hour. For those of you who don't know, uh, I had the, the opportunity to write about this for the National Post. The Historic Empire Club of Canada, which is over 100 years old, did an event today promoting the use of critical race theory in public schools in classrooms with children, teaching them many of these concepts that Mike and Kira outlined. So I've asked Samuel and Noah to offer a summary of what the Empire Club of Canada has been advocating to teachers and to students, and then also to share some of their perspective. Samuel, why don't we start with you? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. after um, suffering over the last hour uh, watching um, the um, Empire Club's critical race theory, um, I guess discussion. I don't want to hear anybody in Canada ever saying that critical race theory is, isn't being taught in Canada or in the schools. So the a brief summary is basically um, they started off by acknowledging the land, which people forget that is actually very much tied to critical race theory when it comes to indigenous perspective. Um, and then they also immediately started talking about really uh, very briefly in a sense how racist the Empire Club is. So it's very interesting <laughs> that the Empire Club had, had uh, invited, you know, uh, welcome this discussion, but yet they immediately mentioned how um, the Empire Club itself, and even the name itself, the Empire itself is racist, which is quite fascinating. Um, and then, um, and then you had, um, you had um, J Joshua Seeley, I'm forgetting his, his full name, but I think it's Joshua Seeley, who started off the, you know, the panel discussion and he basically started off by mentioning Canada Strong and Free Network. Um, he mentioned that um, one of the fascinating things is he really did say that the real issue, um, the real problem here is that conservatives are the problem. Essentially, throughout most of what he was saying, he mentioned conservatives like 10 times. And he was basically saying that critical race theory really is anti-conservative. So for people like James Moore who want to hide and not address these issues, if he is a real conservative, they're really saying that people like him are racist. They're saying that all of us, even if you're black, if you are a conservative, you are essentially, um, um, you're essentially racist for not embracing uh, critical race theory, especially because you are a conservative. And that was very clear in what, in what um, uh, he was saying and what the others were saying as well too. Um, he, yeah, and then after that, you had um, another uh, one of the, the panelists, um, Kerry Daniel, who is the executive director and co-founder of Parents of Black Children, who actually said very explicitly that her organization and her partners have played a major role in bringing critical race theory into curriculums across Canada. So again, <laughs> and, and she was actually seemingly offended that some people are saying that critical race theory isn't being taught in the schools because people like her are actively bringing that into the schools and they see the evidence, it's very obvious, we know this. So she's like, look, stop saying it's not being taught in the schools because it is, because it's part of her job to be making that happen. Um, 
And then you had um, Craig Wellington, who is a consultant. Um, and um, he has said that Canada, his main thing was say that Canada is, uh, has created structures and systems that have maintained uh, racial oppression against indigenous people and, and black Canadians. And one of his examples to be, I'm gonna try to be as kind as possible, but one of his examples has to be, how do I say this? <laughs> Some of the most idiotic things I've ever heard anyone say, to be frank. So his example of systemic racism in Canada is that when he was 19, he immigrated to Canada and about four years afterward, he faced discrimination at square one, which at the time was the biggest mall in Canada. And he says, although he was completely naive and in his own words, although he was stupid, although he had no money, he sued them for discrimination based on his race. And he says he won. So I'm thinking, wait a minute, you are, you are naive, you are young, you are a new immigrant, you are challenging the biggest mall in Canada and you won. So the legal system agreed with you that it was racist and you won. And that's an example of systemic racism. It is so bizarre. Now, all of us, I'm sure in different, in different ways have suffered racism in Canada. My very first day uh, as a new immigrant, my very first day as a, as, a, um, as a student in Canada, I was beat up pretty badly. I had to go, I couldn't go to school for a week or two from a white student. Um, seemingly because of my, of my skin color, because he was saying things in French that seemed to be talking about my appearance. So we, many of us have experienced racism, but we can't say that means then that all of Canada and our systems and our structures are actually racist, right? So um, that's what really was a summary of the entire uh, discussion. It was really saying that Canada is racist and they would use some examples of racism and again, they were really addressing that conservatives are the real problem. So this is politics. This is really about, there's so many things involved here, but primarily it is political. So again, when people like James Moore want to uh, silence us from talking about this, it's that, well, you're really saying you don't care if people are using racism in black people as a way to silence black conservatives or all conservatives. I, as you know, um, uh, Jamil, that, Two years ago, um, uh, a school in Canada, a school in Alberta, invited me to do a talk on, on racism. They didn't tell me really what to say. They just said, hey, we want to have you talk on racism. It's a Christian school. I simply went there and I did a talk on what the Bible says about racism. Afterwards, they released a statement denouncing me for rejecting critical race theory. So when people are not wanting us to have this discussion, they're really saying it's okay for people like me to be silenced and shamed for really talking about my experiences and really how horrific racism is without embracing critical race theory. Well, thank you for the summary, uh, Samuel, the Empire Clubs event. Uh, Noah, what did you make of the event and what's your reaction? Well, I thought that uh, the three panelists, they did a good job really explaining why, uh, you know, critical race theory is controversial and why we shouldn't be, you know, uh, adopting it as just a view that we take for granted in society. And it's definitely not something that we should be introducing into our schools and uh, teaching children. Uh, the sort of basic idea that they put forward is that you know, racism is baked into the pie. As one of the uh, panelists said, you know, racism is like the weather, you know, it's like, you know, it's always there. And, you know, uh, it's like planning for a rainy day. You know, you just have to make preparations to deal with, you know, racism, you know, when you go out on your day, you know, white on black harm, you know, is taken for granted. And, you know, any disparities between white and whites and blacks, whether that be economic or otherwise, you know, it's sort of just taken, as, taken for granted as, you know, white, a white uh, sort of act of aggression uh, on black people and that there's nothing wrong with black communities, black communities and black people, you know, individuals, they don't necessarily need to change, you know, their practices or change anything about their lives. It is the system that is the aggressor. And I think there's clear uh, flaws to that approach. Uh, firstly, it's this, you know, what, uh, one size fits all perspective that it, it doesn't take into consider the many different, uh, it doesn't take into consideration the many different factors uh, for why there may or may not be uh, racial inequality. 
for example, there is a uh, well-documented disparities in, uh, you know, between whites and blacks, you know, in economically and educationally and critical race theorists would, you know, take these, uh, take these studies, take these stats, take these results and come to the conclusion that this is an act of whites, you know, aggressing blacks. It's, you know, whites being racist against blacks. It is the system working against blacks. Uh, when, quite frankly, you can come to many different conclusions. Uh, for example, there was a 2011 study uh, done in the United States that found that, on average, Black students study a lot less than white students, and white students study a lot less than uh, Asian students. And what you see is that white students do better in school generally than Black students, but uh, do better than Black students generally, and Asian students do uh, better than black, uh, white people uh, uh, generally, and this is because of you know not just their cultural practices, but the practices that you know they go through uh, throughout their everyday life. You know, if you study more, you're going to get better grades. You know, it's pretty simple as that. But critical race theory doesn't take that into perspective at all. Uh, if you just look at you know the disparities in grades and you know uh, economic outcomes between blacks, you know the only conclusion that you could come to to is that. You know, it is a system that whites have historically, you know, put together to, you know, ha to keep blacks down, and you know that isn't uh, an explanation that that you know really fits. You know, not uh, fit, fits most such uh, fits most situations in the world. You know, quite frankly, since the 1960s, uh, there was a. Um, there, there, there's uh, Canada and you know, the United States has come to terms with you know how they've been treating blacks and over the decades there's been remarkable progress you know in uh, in, in race relations between whites and blacks yet critical race theory is unable uh, to explain this critical race theory instead you know doesn't uh, view you know this as progress at all it just uh, views racism as changing its form. And sort of, you know, changing the way it presents itself. So instead of, you know, blacks, you know, not being able to attend the same schools as whites, you know, blacks being beaten in the street because of their race, you know, blacks not being able to, you know, uh, enter into society with, you know, the rest of Americans, uh, you know, that system has changed to, you know, a system where uh, the 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 colorblind policies. Uh, in you know the education system or you know just in the law, uh, th these colorblind systems you know they are enmeshed with racism and the uh, outcomes that they produce is uh, it, it, it's uh, proof of racism and you know that doesn't uh, implicate any specific person of racism. It doesn't implicate someone of uh, you know saying something harmful or you know hiring. Uh, uh, hiring different people based on race, you know, it doesn't take that into consideration uh, at all. It just, you know, accuses the system of producing that outcome, even if the system, you know, even if the individuals within that system aren't responsible for producing uh, that outcome. And, you know, this can create uh, quite broad uh, societal ramifications that critical race theorists just ignore. Something we know is that racial discrimination, it creates anim racial animosity. Uh, you know, between the races. Uh, so, and there's no, you know, thought by critical race theorists when they create programs that deliberately exclude white people or, you know, select black people preferentially over white people. You know, these are systems that could create racial animosity um, in, in, in the future. Uh, we know that, uh, we, we know that policies um, and sp uh, specific widespread movements, you know, are able to create societal ramifications uh, decades down the line. For example, with globalism. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna just pause you there if you don't mind, because I do want to make sure we have time for questions, and I will come yeah, back yeah, to no you. Problem. Yeah, I will come back to you for sure. Um, uh, a few questions are coming in, and I want to give Mike and Kira a chance to uh, answer uh, around what do you say to parents? So, you know, people who are hearing about critical race theory, they're concerned about it. What do they do next um, if they don't want their children to be taught these sort of, uh, you know, kind of broad strokes ideologies about groups of people, if they would like their children to be equipped to do some critical thinking of their own and maybe push back on some of this stuff in the classroom. What do you say to parents who are concerned? Uh, Mike, do you want to start? Certainly. Uh, thank you, um, Jamil. I, I think they need to, um, to really um, get in touch with their local MPPs and make it very, very clear 
what is actually taking place in, in our schools. I'll give you a quick example. As I heard um, Kira uh, spoke in her um, opening uh, remarks there about the issue of um, envy, I'll give you a, a real life example of um, how I believe it's part of um, this identity politics that's being practiced. And I remember going uh, as a student in our local high school. I was I graduated from um, KCI, one of our local high schools. And that was back in the 70s. And I saw firsthand, I went to school, where I went to school with the kids of um, families that were thrown out of Uganda by Idi Amin. And that was all identity politics that was uh, being practiced at the time. So I went to school with these kids and they made a life uh, for, the, for themselves. And there were a lot of um, black kids in the school system that I've heard from, not just then, but now, uh, that is talking about how, if they want to study, to Noah's uh, point, they want to study and to excel, they're um, uh, being referred to as um, acting, acting white. That's, what, that, that's the kind of stuff that's being uh, encouraged. So again, I think the things that are underlying all of this, that people need to get this message across to their um, local MPPs. I had an opportunity uh, recently to, um, to connect with a number of um, MPPs and um, cabinet ministers, and some of them weren't aware of what was, uh, at least that was what was expressed to me. They weren't aware of what was going on locally. So I'm encouraging parents, write to your local MPPs, with, regardless of which party uh, they belong to, but especially the people that sit on the government benches, you got to get your point across because they're the main decision makers. And I agree with uh, Jamil, it should be concerning um, when um, conservatives are dismissing Black conservatives as uh, noisemakers, as how um, one person had uh, put it. So I'm not sure if I uh, fully answered your question, Jamil, but uh, can always <laughs> come back to me. But I thought I'd pick up on where um, Kira was saying and to give an example of uh, my experience uh, through the school system and how we cannot or we should not allow um, this to get entrenched, this whole idea of uh, critical uh, race theory. Very dangerous. Kira, do you want to offer any insights for parents? Yeah, the conversation is a little different here in the United States than it is in Canada. You guys are way further down the road with the CRT stuff than we are, um, which is typical um, Canada. I would like to let the audience know that I'm Canadian, actually. I was born and raised in, on Prince Edward Island and did experience a lot of racism there growing up. But my dad was American and... Um, I, I left for America at 18. I've been here ever since. That being said, I've never thought of Canada as a racist country. I experienced racists, but I never, there wasn't ever a moment where I thought, oh, I can't be who I want to be in this, in this country. But now we, we have the situation where that concept is bleeding into how we educate our kids, right? You know, you can't be who you want to be because the system is set up against you. And I think that is absolutely wrong. We're the system. So however we are is how the system is, you know? And um, that being said, I, I, I wish parents that I could tell you, here are the steps for you to cure this disease. Here are the steps for you to fix everything. And it's really easy. One, two, three. And I'm afraid that we are far past any easy solutions here. Any solution to this issue when it comes to what's in your schools and being presented to your children is going to take some time and effort and discomfort on your part. So one thing that you need to do is you need to do what Mike did, what I tried to do, but unsuccessfully here in Southern California, you need to run for your school boards. You need to make sure that the people who are on your school boards are people who think like you. That means you've got to get involved in the next election. Don't just depend on going to the ballot box. Okay, I cast my vote. I did a thing. No, it's not going to be enough because the people on the other side of the equation are highly motivated they are highly motivated to come in between you and your child. You are the barrier for that. So they are highly motivated to get you out of the way. It's not a neutral proposition. They're not neutral at all. We, we've been lulled into this idea that our school boards are neutral, that education is neutral. Not at all. The goal is to separate you from your children, because that's the only way that the state can have due influence over your children and raise the little soldiers that they want to raise. 
And, um, and so you're going to have to get in the way. So run for school board or help somebody who's running for school board, get in there next election cycle. No excuses. You, you sacrifice two months of your life or whatever, go knock on doors, go to meetings, have fundraisers, put out flyers, all of that stuff. The other thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to be up at that school. Whenever you have something that looks weird to you, doesn't sit right with you, you're going to have to, and, and don't just talk to the teacher because the teacher is going to ignore you anyway, right? The, the, the teacher either is helpless, his or herself, or, or they're just going to ignore you because they've got your kid for eight hours a day anyway, and you don't know anything they do in that classroom and you're not allowed to. So um, I can remember, um, let me write down where I stopped here so I can pick up this thread, but I, I can remember um, my husband and I were eating dinner and it was right during the pandemic when we were talking about here in California, sending the kids back to school where we weren't we. And we were sitting next to two young teachers. I was, I was casually eavesdropping, you know, I wasn't, I was trying to mind my own business, but they were talking about school. So what could I do, but lean over. And I was listening to them talk and the, the, the woman said, you know, I don't, I, I do want to go back to the classroom, but I understand if we can't, and I don't mind teaching over Zoom, but the thing that bothers me is I don't think parents should be able to see what I'm teaching because you know how parents get, and I was like, what? You know, I started to stand up, and my husband was like, no, we're having dinner. Like, you, you're going to chill out. <laughs> Just relax, but that was when I realized this is the attitude that a lot of our educators are going into our educational institutions with the idea that you're the problem as a parent. So you know what, make yourself a problem. And guess what? People aren't going to like you. People are going to talk poorly about you. Your neighbors are going to post nasty things about you on Facebook. Um, you might even come up against some legal complications. Um, be a problem. And don't just go to the teacher and don't just go to the principal. Um, I can't exactly speak to how the mechanics work in Canada, but I'm sure they're about the same as here. Your principal is just a glorified administrator. They have no power. Their job is to appease you. Their job is to make you go away as soon as possible. Who has the power is your school board. So you need to make sure that you are contacting your school board, your, your superintendent, as well as your political representatives, as well as your teachers. It's a whole thing. Now you're asking yourself, this is a lot of work, Kira. I don't know. Okay, well, the question is, what can parents do? It's not a convenient answer. We're way too far down this rabbit hole for easy answers, I'm afraid. It's going to take some brave citizens and it's going to take some work to dig our kids out of this hole. The other thing, excuse me, <clears throat> The other thing that um, that you need to do is, or that you can do is find a group. There's strength in numbers. Maybe you don't wanna be the only parent up at that school or looking at what books are in the library or what's going on in the classroom. Is there a group near you that is, that is engaged in that? Here in the US, we have Moms for Liberty, um, which is a great group and they have different chapters where you are. There might be a Facebook group that's forming of concerned parents. Find a group, there's strength in numbers. If there is no group, start a group. You'd be surprised how many people join the group. How many people are just concerned and want uh, a safe place to talk about it? So, so do that. At the end of the day, there are no easy solutions here. I'll end with this. I always, um, I always ask parents if you, if you, if you're a parent out there, would you die for your kid? Would you die for your kid? I think the answer across the board is yeah. That yeah, of course, I would die for my kid. Well, that's the no-brainer. That's the easy part. Dying for your kid is a no brainer. I take a bullet for my kids in the sec in a second. Would you get uncomfortable for your kid? Would you risk your reputation for your kid? Would you maybe risk your livelihood for your kid? Would you risk a good relationship with your neighbors for your kid? Would you risk being called a racist for your kid? Suddenly we're thinking about, you know, different types of risks. It's easy to say, I'll give my life. It's not so easy to say, I'll give all of the things that make my life comfortable. And we're just in a time where we're going to have to get uncomfortable. And so 
I hope I didn't depress anybody with that answer, but it's like, it took us a long time to get here. It's going to take a minute to dig out. Can I just add 30 seconds, um, Jamil? Sure. 30 seconds, Sorry, Mike. Uh, just at a point that um, Kira mentioned, it just remind me um, about, you know, her saying parents uh, to get involved. Um, our Minister of Education, uh, Stephen Lecce, uh, is quoted as saying, and this was uh, last year, and I was reminded of it uh, last week, he talked about the goal of education is to teach kids how to think, not what to think. And I think it goes to that point, um, what Kira was saying about parental uh, involvement. And I want to say a little bit about Canada. Uh, my experience is that we have a lot of dedicated administrators, but they're running scared also in terms of speaking up and to saying to the directors that are, un I call them unsigned the directors that are coming from the board, that they must do this. They are pushing back in their own subtle way, but you know what? They're scared for their careers. And I'm not saying it should be a valid excuse, but they're scared for their careers. So I fully understand. So to your point, I just wanted to just add that. Thanks, Jamil. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mike. And uh, it would be nice if uh, Minister Stephen Lecce practiced what he preached there. I mean, he has overseen the rapid expansion of critical race theory into Ontario public schools while calling himself a conservative. Adding himself, by the way, to the list that includes James Moore and others who continue to misrepresent what it means to be a conservative and basically seem to want to offer just liberal with aspartame. That is not what it means to be a conservative, diet liberalism. And uh, whether it's Stephen Lecce, James Moore, the Empire Club of Canada, we can go on and on. I think it's certainly clear we've got to draw some lines in the sand here. And the critical race theory debate is certainly an important one. Uh, with the time we have left, I do want to try to aggregate some of the questions we're getting. Our friend Quinton had an excellent question about counter narratives. Others are asking about uh, what does it mean in terms of the disparities that exist between different groups of people. Uh, Samuel, I'm going to come to you uh, with this first. What do you say to people who say, well, then, if not CRT, what? How do we explain inequality? What do you want us to do next? Um, what is the counter narrative we're offering to try to advance a better world, a more just world? Well, speaking of narrative, as I've been, as I was um, watching the Empire Club's narrative about racism, I couldn't help remember what Martin Luther King Jr. said about Canada in 1967. We've forgotten. Um, they, they, they make so many claims about all the things that we don't teach about Canadian history. We've forgotten what Martin Luther King Jr. said about our country when he visited Toronto in 1967. This is what he said. Deep in our history, he's referring to America, deep in our history of struggle for freedom, Canada was a North Star, the star followed by the Underground Railroad. Railroad. We sang of heaven that awaited us and the slave masters listened to innocence, not realizing that we are not speaking of the hereafter. Heaven was the word for Canada. That's not to say that Canada is perfect, especially at that time. But even then, Martha King Jr. was saying that Canada was a good nation for black people. And now you have what, 60 years later, where these people are dismissing Canada as a racist nation. So in terms of if, if racism isn't the reason for the disparities, then what is it? Well, there are many variables, as Noah has said, there are so many different reasons. I think what's unhelpful is for us to say it's only racism. I don't have an issue saying that racism has played some role in some situations, right? It, I don't know every situation. But when it comes to um, using one narrative to explain so many different kinds of variables, it's really unhelpful. It doesn't help anybody, right? Speaking of, speaking of the disparities, sadly, one of the biggest problems that we have in Canada, it's also true in America. It's also true in, in, in Britain and Australia and in many different places around the, around the West, is that one of the biggest disparities is there is a disparity of Black fathers in the home. A lot of us are uncomfortable with the situation uh, or this this uh, this talk uh, th this point, but I've lived it, and it does create problems. So, for example, when Noah mentioned that, unfortunately, a lot of black students tend to not study as as much as white students. The biggest reason for that, I believe, because I saw it in my own life, is because too often there aren't fathers in the home to lead um, children in that area. 
So for example, uh, as you mentioned that Asian students tend to be, you know, the best socioeconomically, well, that's because they are the group uh, in Canada and, um, and the US and also, also um, um, Indians as well too, in that way, that's, it's the biggest factor in that tends to be that there is a higher rate of fathers in the home. But that's not the only reason. There are so many different variables. And I think we need to look at all these situations independently instead of just assuming it has to be because of racism. So Noah, I want you to for kind of follow up on, on Samuel's point there. And is, is, a, is a more sophisticated, nuanced conversation what people are looking for? Because one of the points Quinton makes in the chat there is that CRT's appeal might be that it is offering a simplistic explanation for complicated social realities. Um, do you think the, the challenge is to offer an alternative or to maybe push for just more nuance and more complexity? Yeah, I think that you're exactly right. We do need to look for more nuance and complexity instead of just, you know, defaulting uh, to answering our questions about racial inequality as, you know, as to being the cause, the cause being racism, we can instead look at the uh, many uh, factors that, you know, create success in one area and uh, see if, you know, these different groups are, you know, doing what is required. Uh, to achieve success in, in uh, that area at the same rate. It's the uh, prerequisites to success. Are Blacks succeed, uh, achieving and you know, fulfilling the prerequisites to success in a variety of uh, fields uh, at the same rates and levels as white students or Asian students or any other uh, racial group? You know, that, uh, just you know, looking at the factors to what causes success uh, in a, a specific field or area of study or whatever, uh, you can eliminate a lot of claims of uh, systemic racism or a lot of the uh, claims that a critical race theorists, uh, you know, put forward. And I think, you know, one of the problems with critical race theory is that when you, you know, put their claims, you know, to a strict analysis, when you, uh, you, when they claim that, you know, the Canada is systemically racism, you know, black people are disproportionately affected from the critical race theory, uh, and, but also Asian uh, Canadians are also uh, affected by, uh, you know, systemic racism, uh, then we have to ask why is it that Asian, uh, Asian Canadians and, you know, Asian Americans perform better than white Canadians and white Americans? Uh, is it because the system is working uh, against them or is the system working for them? And if the system is working against them, why is it that they have been able to, you know, uh, to succeed in spite of the system working against them? And if that is the case, then why can't Black people succeed in spite of the system working against them? And why is it that there are dozens, hundreds, thousands of very successful Black Canadians and Americans, uh, Black Canadians uh, like you, Jamil, and you, Samuel, uh, but also, you know, Black Americans like you know, Jay-Z, you know, you know, billionaires, you know, Black uh, Canadians and Americans who have become, you know, some of the richest, most successful, you know, Black people on the face of this planet. You know, why is it that these are the societies that have produced, you know, the most successful, you know, Black people in the world? And the reason for that is because Canada, the United States, Canada specific, is not a racist country. You know, there may be racist people within Canada, uh, and, you know, they, they might taint the, uh, taint the um, uh, life experience of uh, some uh, Canadians, uh, spe specifically Black Canadians, but you can't look at, you know, a outliers and, you know, take, the, uh, take those outliers and, you know, define the entire country, the entire society by those outliers. Uh, so I think, you know, just in general, we need to take a more nuanced approach to evaluating things so that when there is true racism, we are able to properly call it out. But when there are when there are uh, there's an effect that is you know, caused by something other than racism, we are able to address the root causes and actually solve the problem instead of just defaulting to this, you know, quite frankly, uh, discriminatory claim uh, that you know, it is just white people that are the ones that are keeping you down, even though you can't really point to a specific white person that is keeping you down, any specific law that is keeping you down. Jamil, can I say something very, just to add to that? Sure. Very yeah, quickly. go ahead. Um, you know, the, the issue with blaming some of the disparities on racism is that it might be the simple answer, but it's been proven over the last 30 years not to be the simple solution. Nothing has helped. 
it has not helped whatsoever. In fact, it's getting worse. The disparities are getting worse. So if the simplest answer is not leading to a simple solution, we need to start looking at a different answer, right? And I think that's the biggest concern I have with this. All these meetings, all these empire clubs, nothing is helping. And that's why we need to start looking for a different answer than just simply saying it's systemic racism. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, Samuel. You know, it's, I think a lot of the time critical race theorists would like for us to focus on debating the problems. Um, the reality is a lot of the problems are well documented. It's not that, it, it, there's not a lot of debate to be had. Where there is tremendous debate to be had is what we do about the problems. How do we solve them? How do we move forward? How do we make sure we have a more fair and just society? And I think that's where, um, certainly I speaking for myself, where I would part ways with critical race theorists the most is on solutions, not necessarily on uh, defining the problems. Okay, uh, let's uh, do some quick wrap up with the last uh, few minutes that we have. I'm gonna start with you, uh, Noah, just uh, maybe in like a minute, uh, Max, just give us a sense of how you'd like to end the conversation. Yeah, I just think that we should be moving away from a focus uh, on the, the importance of race. You know, white supremacists and critical race theorists make, you know, the common point that race is relevant, you know, but relevant to what? What exactly are we? It, it, race might be relevant to, you know, who you might want to date and marry, for example. I think, you know, there's nothing wrong to discriminate racially in that sense. But, you know, for like a job or for you know, uh, a, a spot in, like, in an educational student. Why is race relevant? Uh, race might be, a, it might, might, might be a reason as to why you know, someone might have faced discrimination in the past, but you know, many people can face discrimination for many different reasons. And you sort of have to get to the root cause and you can't sort of just assume that you know, black people have, uh, are always you know, uh, oppressed and white people are always oppressors. You know, if, we, if we do the hard work of you know, finding real solutions, find what really causes you know, certain outcomes, you know, you know, then uh, we are able to uh, solve, uh, solve our problems. But you know, because we don't wanna do that hard work, you know, because calling someone racist uh, by, uh, after you point out a disparity is the easy part. Finding out what causes the disparity is the hard part. So instead of, you know, doing, you know, the easy thing by just name calling, you know, people racist, we have to do the hard work and figure out what is causing these disparities so that we can then address them and, you know, draft you know, right, proper you. solutions. Thanks, Noah. Appreciate it. All right, Samuel, your closing comments? Yeah, I want to just go back to what I said earlier from what one of the panelists said at um, the at the Empire Club. Thirty years ago, when he was around, in, when he when he was in his early twenties as a new immigrant to Canada, even though he is, he says he was stupid, he said he was naive, he faced racism from the biggest mall in Canada. He sued them. He had no money. Again, he was na naive, new immigrant to Canada, and he won. That was thirty years ago. To him, that's an example of systemic racism. I say, no, that's an example of the system working. And that's where we live in today. That was 30 years ago. Things have gotten better even, even then. I wanna celebrate that as, as a Canadian, instead of condemning our nation for doing the right thing in that situation. Okay, thank you, Samuel. Uh, Kira, do you wanna give us your final thoughts? Yeah, I think part of the apparatus of CRT is the same thing we've been seeing throughout history, um, which is we're not really allowed to solve problems. We're not supposed to solve problems according to the government. If the government solves problems, there's a lot of people out of work. <laughs> in the, you know, I look down here in in the states, we have uh, guys like Al Sharpton who are basically. Um, you know, they give their stamp of approval, their, their anti-racist stamp of approval. You, 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 you want to get the black vote or you want to repent for maybe a, a sin of, of speech. You go to Al Sharpton, you give him a little money under the table. He takes you out in public. You guys shake hands and you get that seal of approval. If Al Sharpton solves racism, what happens to Al Sharpton's network? What happens to Al Sharpton's business? So critical race theory is a business like everything else. And it's sad to see that the Canadian government and the American government are in the business of discrimination, but it's just another form of discrimination. And of course we can't solve the problem because the solution to the problem is freedom. 
the solution to the problem is more people being free to make as many of their own choices as possible and deal with the consequences of those choices, you know, as as the universe sees fit, as the marketplace sees fit. And um, and choice is something that big governments don't really like. All right, uh, final word goes to you, Mike. Thank you, Jamil. And to your point about uh, solutions and everything that uh, my uh, friends on the panel have been saying, I think I could just sum it up this way that um, we need to, in terms of solutions, we need to teach or to try and emphasize and to get across the decision makers that all of our history, the good and the bad from all sides needs to be taught. And it would, if, if that happens, it would give no justification for separate graduation ceremonies for black kids, uh, separate celebrations, uh, like just with the identity politics, it would give no justification 50, 60 years after Martin Luther King and what he did uh, to bring things uh, forward. And it's almost like we're moving backwards uh, with, with CRT. So our shared history needs to be taught the good and the bad, what everyone did. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mike. Wishing you the best at the Waterloo Region uh, District or School Board regional district school board. Uh, Kira, thank you for joining us uh, from California. Uh, Noah and Sam, always a pleasure to, to have you guys joining us here at the Canada Strong and Free Network. I'd like to leave our audience with just two questions to think about. The first one is, why do you think the Empire Club of Canada and James Moore and people of this ilk do not want you to hear these perspectives from Black communities? I think it's an important question to take away from this conversation. Why is it that they seem to want you to think we all think the same way and that there's no diversity of opinion, viewpoint, politics within our communities? That's one set of questions I'd ask you to consider. The second set of questions I'd ask you to consider is, why haven't you bought a ticket yet to our conference next month, March 22nd and 24th in Ottawa? Please be there. You will hear from uh, Pierre Polyev, Stephen Harper, Danielle Smith, many others, including Noah Jarvis. And uh, we hope that you'll be there uh, again, March 22nd and 24th at the West in Ottawa. Tickets available now. Thank you for joining us for this important conversation about critical race theory. Take care, everybody.